the early church. My first argument to you is that we cannot answer that question without resolving a prior question. How did the fourth century church know the church of the first and second centuries? That's the real question. I put the question this way because the fourth century was the time when the church came above ground. The Edict of Constantine made us for the first time a tolerated religion within the Roman Empire. We did not have to gather liturgically at midnight and in wee hours and in hidden house churches. We were now free to come out and worship visibly. The great basilicas were put up for the first time in the fourth century and it's from that century that we have our first evidence of what early Christian worship was like. And it wasn't simple. Whether you read the uh, liturgy of St. James, which comes from Jerusalem, or the liturgy of St. Mark, which comes from Alexandria, or the various Syriac liturgies, you will find a very complicated rite, R-I-T-E. It was also in this time that the church had an enormous explosion in writing. It was in this time that we had our first ecumenical council at Nicaea 325. And it was at this time that uh, all of the Arian controversies before, during, and after that council produced a wave of writing. And it was also in this century that we got our first historian, Eusebius. All right, Eusebius is a fourth century historian. My question is, how did he know what he was talking about? He wrote a history of the church from apostolic times down to his own day. The church had been underground. How did he know what he was talking about? Well, it's easy to run through the main heads of the evidence he had. First of all, he had earlier writers who often quote still earlier writers. For example, he had the reminiscences of Polycarp. And he was also able to quote from the reminiscences of Hegesippus. Now, Hegesippus is not a household word. <laughs> Very interesting man, a Palestinian Christian who was extremely interested in family matters and who gives us our best information about the relatives of Jesus. I'll come back to him. Then we have a lot of information available to Eusebius in an earlier work like the Epistle of Barnabas, which showed Eusebius how from the very earliest times, New Testament, sub-apostolic times, the Christians had interpreted the scriptures. Next, he had information from the cities in which there were long established churches. In those cities, records were kept, lists were kept of their past bishops. We have confirmation of that not only from Eusebius's access to those lists, but also from Irenaeus's access and Tertullian's. Irenaeus cites the succession within two or three major C's. How Peter put in place Clement, who then put in place the next one and the next one. How Mark put in place his successor and the next one after that in Alexandria. How Peter put in place Ignatius, 
no, sorry, Evodius, and after Evodius, Ignatius in the Sea of Antioch, and so on and so on down to his own time. Now, why was it important for Irenaeus? I mean, it's lucky for us, but why was it important for Irenaeus to cite these lists showing the exact succession of bishops in the major seas? Well, the reason was that this kind of evidence was part of Irenaeus' uh, conflict with the Gnostics. The Gnostics, whom Father Pacwa was just a moment ago talking about, were doctrinal innovators. But they said that what they were teaching was the secret good news. That what was taught publicly in the church was the exoteric message. That is to say, the message for the great unwashed, for the hoi polloi, for ordinary people, but there had also been handed down an inner, an esoteric message. This for the adepts, this for the spiritually perfect. And now the Gnostic teachers were promulgating that. All right, says Irenaeus, if you are handing down a knowledge transmitted from the apostles, show us the genealogy, the record, the list of your teachers. Of course, Irenaeus well knew that these supposed secret messages had been made up yesterday. And as Father Pacwa said, they were concocted in a variety of fashions. The Gnostic teachers were not in agreement with one another. Whereas the church was not only united in what it believed, so that as Irenaeus says, she speaks throughout the whole world as if she had a single mouth. But also the church was connected in time to the apostolic generation so that we had lists showing us whom the apostles had approved as teachers in their place and whom those approved teachers had approved in teachers as teachers in their place and so on down generation by generation. I can't resist quoting to you a passage of similar effect from Tertullian. He says, let these heretics produce the original records of their churches. Let them unfold the role of their bishops running down in due succession from the beginning in such a manner that their first bishop shall be able to show for his ordainer and predecessor some one of the apostles or apostolic men. A man, moreover, who continued steadfast with the apostles. For this is the manner in which the apostolic churches transmit their registers, their fastos, their registers. As the church of Smyrna, which records that Polycarp was placed therein by John. And also the church of Rome, which makes Clement to have been ordained in like manner by Peter. Let the heretics contrive something of the same kind, says Tertullian. So, from these important anti-Gnostic arguments and also from records in cities, we have bishop lists uh, from uh, early times. Then, of course, among the earlier writers whose work was still available to Eusebius was Justin Martyr, also mentioned to you a few minutes ago by Father Pacwa. Justin Martyr wrote uh, books called Apologiae, doesn't mean apologies, it means defenses. He wrote a first and second defense of the Christians and then a dialogue with Trypho. Well, in those defenses, he's handling the charge that the Christians gather 
at midnight because they're up to no good. Why can't they meet in broad daylight? You know why? You know why? You know why? It's because they're getting together for cannibalistic feasts. See how the idea that they're eating somebody's body and blood would have gotten out and spread in pagan gossip? Thyestian feasts. They're eating people's flesh at night. That's what they're doing. So to counter that kind of stuff, uh, Justin Martyr gives us some early portrayals of the main Christian services, the Eucharist and the baptismal services. So we have some idea how the Eucharist was celebrated, how the priest prayed over the gifts and so on, how the consecrated elements were then distributed. In his passage about baptism, we have information about how people were baptized using the Trinitarian formula. Justin Martyr's information on those topics is corroborated by another early work which Eusebius still had available to him, the work of a chap named Hippolytus. Hippolytus was an important theologian in the Roman church uh, early in the third century. And one of the things that Hippolytus set out to do was to collect all the traditions that could certainly be labeled apostolic. He was aware that there are many traditions and customs in the church, some of them varying quite a bit from place to place, but everybody wanted to be faithful to the apostolic tradition. And it was the great boast of the See of Rome, reported to us by Irenaeus, that in her, the fullness of the richness of the tradition of the apostles had been deposited. So Hippolytus undertook to learn uh, the apostolic traditions. And he tells us very many useful things, including how to end your prayers doxologically. That is, we'd say, with a formula of praise. So that the way we conclude collects in the Mass to this day is certainly, at least Hippolytus thought, of apostolic origin, who lives and reigns with thee in the church, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever, world without end, or unto the ages of ages, yes? The only phrase which is no longer in common use in that doxology is the phrase, in the church. But that phrase is in the oldest prayers we have in the oldest liturgy we have, the liturgy of St. James from Jerusalem. All right. Then we have his information on how to baptize, and it's once again very Trinitarian. According to Hippolytus, the way the apostles did it was by threefold immersion. First, the baptismal candidate is asked, do you believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? He says yes, and he's dunked for the first time. When he comes up again, he's asked, do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God who died, and so on and so on? He says yes, dunked again. Then when he comes up for air, he is asked, and do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, and so on? He says yes again, and he's dunked for the third time. All right. Information about sacramental practice, information about prayer life, information about uh, offices in the church, fascinating reading there in Hippolytus on the apostolic tradition. It has not come down to us whole, but we have lots of it. Next, of course, um, Eusebius had available to him the earlier writing that we now call First Clement. First Clement really is by Clement and really is an epistle. 
Second Clement is not by Clement, and it's not an epistle. <laughs> what it is, is somebody's absolutely gorgeous early sermon at a baptism. Well, who's I don't know. But anyway, first Clement really is by Clement, the successor of Peter in the Sea of Rome. It was written about the year 96 AD. And what we find in that document is evidence on the submission of disputes to Rome. Now, I know that all of you have heard this story a hundred times, but the, what prompted the writing of this letter in 96 AD was a crisis in the church in Corinth. People there were highly dissatisfied with their bishop and they wanted to depose him. Well, I didn't know if they could do that. So they wrote a letter. Now, I don't know, I haven't got my geography quite as exact as I should like. But as I look at the map of the Eastern Mediterranean, the great patriarchal sea of Alexandria is a whole lot closer to Corinth than Rome is. For that matter, Jerusalem is closer to Corinth than Rome is. I won't talk about Constantinople because it didn't exist yet in 96 AD. And you could say, well, he didn't write to, um, he didn't write to Jerusalem because things were a mess there. It was only 20 years or so after the sack of the place. But why didn't he write to Alexandria? Why did he write to Rome? Interesting question. Unless you're reading this important piece of evidence in the light of Matthew 16, 16, and John 21, the conferral of the primacy, and other evidence of the leadership role of Peter and hence of his successors within the church. We also uh, can be reasonably sure that Eusebius, since we know he wasn't blind, had available to him evidence from early Christian art. It is a fascinating subject. There's a lot of it in the catacombs, but you also would have had it in early uh, churches and uh, later on, of course, in the great basilicas fourth century basilicas. Now in the art work that we can securely date to the second century, our Lord is depicted 440 times. Now who do you suppose is the next most depicted figure? Yeah. You know all this already. The second most depicted figure is Peter, 212 times. And in addition to those 212, in which case he's shown really as Peter, there are a hundred more in which he is shown in the guise of Moses, which is where the tradition comes down from of showing Peter with these little horns and so on um, in imitation of the, the shine on the head of Moses. Peter is shown with the keys. He's shown sitting as a teacher on a rock and reading a book. After we got above ground in the fourth century, the art changed a little bit and Peter was shown sitting in a chair. This is social promotion. But anyway, <laughs> in the earliest, he's shown sitting on a rock reading a book. Where he's presented as Moses, he is often receiving a book from Christ. And it says on the cover of the book, Lex, the law, or Dei Lex, the law of God, or Dominus Legem Dot, the Lord giveth the law. So Christ is to Peter as God was to Moses on Mount Sinai, giving the law, which makes Peter the new legal authority within the church. Sometimes, in the guise of Moses, St. Peter is shown striking a rock. And water comes out of the rock whereof Roman soldiers may drink. And sometimes Peter is also shown carrying a lamb, like the good shepherd. 
So the second most often depicted person is Peter. 212, no, 312 times in all. Then comes St. Paul, 47 times. So you know these pictures were not drawn by Southern Baptists. <laughs> then comes the group of the apostles as a whole with Peter. That's shown 30 times. Moses 37 times. Daniel a couple of times. Elijah a couple of times. And then after that, it's down to one or two occurrences. Well, that kind of information was available to Eusebius. And let us not forget that he still had available to him the correct text of Ignatius of Antioch. Those epistles of Ignatius provide crucial information on the uniformity of the episcopate. Now these letters were written in the year 107 when Ignatius is under arrest being taken on his way to martyrdom in Rome. In the letter to the Ephesians, he greets Onesimus, your bishop. In the second chapter of Magnesians, he greets Damas, your godly bishop. In Trallians 1, he greets Polybius, your bishop. In the second chapter of Romans, he says he calls himself a bishop. He says, God hath vouchsafed to the bishop of Syria that he should be found in the West. And he bears witness in the same chapter of his epistle to the Romans that Peter and, I'm sorry, in the fourth chapter, that Peter and Paul were in Rome. In the epistle to the Philadelphians, he says, be at one with your bishop. In Smyrnaeans chapter 8, he says, follow your bishop. Well, as a matter of fact, at that time, the bishop was Polycarp. He was 37 years old at that time. And Ignatius sent another letter to Polycarp personally covering some of the same subject matter that was in the epistle to the Smyrnian church. Well, that's the whole roster of his epistles. He's got bishops to greet in every one of them. Okay. Now we have to face the neuralgic question. All of the evidence of this sort and some others, which I could have mentioned, the Didache and so on, that was available to Eusebius. Was all that evidence too late to be trusted? Well, 96 doesn't sound too late, 107 doesn't sound too late, but Rudolf Bultmann has pioneered within the club of exegetes an extremely widespread position according to which all of the evidence available to poor old Eusebius was too late to be reliable. Bultmann pioneered, invented, a scheme of ideological development. He invented this scheme in an effort begun in the 1930s to carry form criticism one stage further than it had been carried before. Form criticism originally is simply about sorting parts of scripture into their correct literary genre and was used with high success by Hermann Gunkel in classifying the Psalms. Some as community laments, some as individual laments, pilgrimage songs, coronation anthems, and so on and so on. Very good work. This kind of work was then applied to the Gospels, and the sayings of Jesus were classified into various kinds, and the stories were classified into various kinds, stories that lead up to a saying, stories that lead up to a miracle, and so on and so on. Again, not bad, but Bultmann wanted to go a step further and sort these units 
chronologically. He wanted to be able to show which of the stories were really old, really went back to Jesus. The fancy German adjective is Jesuanic. Which ones were really Jesuanic and which ones were invented later by the evangelists or handed down within the several communities with which the evangelists were allegedly associated and so on. As a result of his highly speculative effort to put the sayings and stories of Jesus into a chronological order and compare that order with the other books of the New Testament, their messages, Bultmann came up with an elaborate scheme of early Christian ideological development. He says the first stage was Palestinian Christianity, in which the emphasis on, is on Jesus simply as the Jewish Messiah. Next comes early mission Christianity. Then comes Gentile mission or Pauline Christianity. Then Johannine and then and only then free Catholicismus as Bultmann called it in his lovely German, early Catholicism, all right? Now, early Catholicism is the position of Ignatius, Clement, and everybody else I've cited here. Bultmann thinks that all of our historical evidence for what the early church was like is colored or even concocted from the early Catholic point of view. But the really early church was nothing like that, thinks Bultmann. Now here Bultmann is in a long tradition among uh, German scholars. <clears throat> the tradition uh, goes back to the inventor of German liberal Protestantism, Adolf Ritschel, who in 1857 wrote a book on the, uh, the rise, the Entstehung of early Catholicism. And the most famous member of the liberal Protestant school of scholars in Germany was Adolf Harnack. And in his multi-volume History of Dogma, Harnack portrayed a development from a Jesus Harnack could like. A gentle, meek, mild, liberal sort of a fellow <laughs> into the intimidating Christ figure that we have in the Gospels and in John, and then this highly deified figure that we find in Orthodoxy. All right. So Boltmann is standing in a long tradition. He's got his own reasons for joining that tradition, however, because he's got his own system for organizing the sayings of Jesus into uh, chronological levels. All right. And according to this scheme, there are three main huge metamorphoses that occurred in getting from the original thing, Palestinian Christianity, to this end of the first century thing called early Catholicism. Those three huge metamorphoses were number one, a metamorphosis from low Christology to high Christology. Number two, a metamorphosis from unstructured communities to a hierarchically structured church. And number three, a metamorphosis from a word or preaching centered ministry to a sacrament centered ministry. All right. Now then, it's obvious that if Bultmann is right, then the early church was really nothing like the church 
that you and I belong to, the church whose history Eusebius wrote, and the church in which Ignatius of Antioch thought he was a bishop. The real early church was nothing like that. It was much more, oh, how shall I say, Protestant-like. <laughs> Except that at least historical Protestantism didn't dismantle high Christology, it just inherited it. But according to Bultmann, the church starts with a very low Christology. There is a human being in whom God is in some interesting way acting, but it's a human being. He serves as the Messiah and so on. Boltmann thought that the first move in promotion from a low Christology to a high was the line we get at the end of Peter's sermon at Pentecost. This same Jesus whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. So God promoted him at the resurrection to be curios. Okay. The next stage was to move the promotion earlier. And Boltmann thinks the next stage is shown in the stories of the baptism of Jesus in the Gospels. Jesus had been an ordinary human being, but then at his baptism, a funny thing happened. The Holy Spirit descended upon him. The Father spoke to him and promoted him to sonship. Yet another stage is marked in Boltmann's promotional scheme by the infancy narratives in Matthew and Luke. Now it turns about that God was involved in some unusual way in bringing about the very birth of Jesus. So he was not only Lord after his baptism or after his resurrection, but already at birth. He's Kyrios and Christos from birth. Then the final stage of promotion, according to Bultmann, is in the later Pauline epistles and in John, namely that he's divine already before he was born. This is pre-existence. With pre-existence of Jesus in a divine condition, we have high Christology, okay? I don't need to um, belabor what's involved in the alleged metamorph metamorphosis from um, unstructured communities to a hierarchically structured church. I don't need to belabor that because the late Father Raymond Brown has already belabored it tragically. In 1970, Brown published a book called Priest and Bishop. If you don't know it, um, I recommend you look at it. It is horrendous and was used throughout the 70s in seminars given to bishops for their theological tune-up. Listen to what Brown says on page 72 of his book. The presbyter bishops described in the New Testament were not in any traceable way the successors of the 12 apostles. How do you like that? Not in any traceable way. The claims of various sees to descend from particular members of the 12 are highly dubious. And then we get this. This is on page 73. It is quite plausible that when churches without presbyter bishops ultimately established them, they did so in imitation of churches that already had them, but many times without any special apostolic appointment. And so the affirmation that all the bishops of the early Christian church could trace their appointments or ordinations to the apostles is simply without proof. It's impossible to trace with assurance any of the presbyter bishops to the twelve, and it's possible to trace only some of them to apostles like Paul. The affirmation that the episcopate was divinely established or established by Christ himself, well, 
can be defended in the nuanced sense, get this, that the Episcopate um, gradually emerged in a church that um, stemmed from Christ. And that this emergence was, um, in the eyes of faith, <laughs> guided by the Holy Spirit. All right? Standard, modernist, evolutionary account of the rise of the Episcopate. And to sugar this over, Brown says, well, personally, I don't think that tracing the appearance of the Episcopate more directly to the Holy Spirit than to the historical Jesus takes away any dignity from the bishops. As if the fact that the successors, that the bishops are successors of the apostles weren't the fine dogma. As if Vatican I had not defined that Peter's jurisdiction was given to him by the historical Jesus directly and immediately. And as if the decree lamentabili in 1907 had not explicitly forbidden the following proposition. This is number 50 in lamentabili, quote, the elders who functioned as overseers in the Christian communities were made presbyters or bishops by the apostles in order to provide the ordering necessary in the growing communities, but not, properly speaking, in order to perpetuate the apostolic mission and power. The condemned proposition is actually better than what Brown said. Well, let that rest. And of course, you all know what would be involved in a transformation from a, a preaching-centered ministry to a sacrament-centered ministry because many of us have come out of churches in which almost the favorite thing St. Paul ever said was, I didn't come to baptize, but to preach the gospel. In other words, the preaching of the gospel is center and all this, all this other stuff is peripheral, symbolic, nice, but not necessary, whatever. All right. So if Bultmann is right and Brown is right and so on about these transmogrifications, then we really know next to nothing about the earliest church until Herr Bultmann or Father Brown, God rest his soul, writes his next book to tell us more about it. Now, I want to argue to you, I'm running out of time, I know, and this is the second long speech in a row, and I appreciate your discomfort, so I'm going to try to get this a little short. I want to say to you, first of all, that Bultmann's theory is antecedently improbable. It violates certain canons of historical common sense. Okay? Look. Everybody knows that within a religion, its beliefs and practices are among the slowest things to change in the course of history. And the changes are resisted. Think of the little changes introduced by Peter the Great in the conduct of the Russian church, resistance by the old believers who had themselves martyred rather than change how they held their fingers when making the sign of the cross. Think of Islam, right? And the invention of the minaret. The Wahhabi sect within Islam denies that minarets are licit and has burned them down wherever they were in a mosque in Arabia. Later innovation. We know how fiercely the fathers of the second century resisted the innovations of first Gnostic and then Arian theology. Well then, 
wouldn't you expect very slow and highly resisted change? From a religion that says Jesus was king of the Jews to a religion that says he was God and the son of God from all eternity, wouldn't that be slow? How could it happen over 50 years or less? Wouldn't you expect that the introduction of sacraments would be slow and resented? And certainly, come on, everybody knows how much changes in power structure are resisted. All right? If the early church had like, I don't know, uh, freely elected or spirit designated ad hoc leaders, don't you think they would have put up something of a stink about being removed in favor of ordained persons. And yet, neither in the New Testament, nor in Clement, nor in Ignatius, is there any trace, nor in Barnabas. We have not one single document in which there is a trace <coughs> of these fights, resistances, or for that matter, of the mutations themselves. And my second his canon of historical common sense is, look, a silk purse does not evolve into a sow's ear. Could you, I mean, look, Allegedly, in New Testament times, and for all practical purposes, Protestant early church evolved in 50 years into a Catholic church. That happened, according to Bultmann. Well, Protestantism was, let's say, rediscovered in 1517 and has therefore been in the world now approximately 500 years. Can you cite me an example of a Protestant church which has evolved into a Catholic one? <laughs> Acquired sacraments and bishops for itself. There is no example. The Lutherans talk about baptism and the Eucharist. They inherited them. In Sweden, they kept some bishops. They inherited them. I can only think of one example of a church that evolved the other way. From a more Catholic sort of position to a more Protestant sort of position, that's the Anglican church. And we know why that happened, because Anglicanism was an unstable political compromise from the beginning. Have you ever known, get this, of a monarchy to evolve into a republic? <laughs> no. Monarchies are overthrown and replaced by republics. And there's always a resistance, isn't there? Long live the Vendée, et cetera, et cetera. There's always a resistance. But it, it doesn't come about by peaceful evolution. Don't cite England to me as a counterexample. <laughs> there was a highly unpeaceful revolution in 1688 in which Parliament staged a coup against the legitimate king. All right. Now that I've got my Jacobean credentials out into the open. <laughs> a silk purse does not evolve into a sow's ear nor vice versa. So it would be astonishing if early Christianity had gone through anything like these transformations. Now, finally, um, and I could go on at great length, but in mercy to you, I won't. <laughs> I'm just going to say real quick why the evidence, such as it is, is all the other way, okay? Let's start with high Christology. The oldest theological epistle that we have in the New Testament is 1 Corinthians. 
Thessalonians is earlier, but it's less theological in content. 1 Corinthians is the first sort of lengthy theological discourse ever produced in the Christian community. And it is absolutely securely dated to the year 51. Okay. What is the Christology in 1 Corinthians? You find out in chapter 1, or you have to read far. Just get to verse 24 in chapter 1. And what will you read? Christon, thou dynamin kai thou sophian. Christ power of God and wisdom of God. Okay. Wisdom Christology. There it is. Wisdom Christology is also alluded to in 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Paul has been saying, you know, the pagans have lots of gods, but for us, there is just one God, the Father, ex who, from whom are all things, and one Lord Jesus Christ, d who, through whom are all things. That preposition through, dia, is the same preposition in John's prologue. Through him were all things made, and without him was not anything made that was made. The world was made dia autu, through him. Same preposition. What's the significance of that preposition? It is in the Septuagint of Proverbs 8. Proverbs 8 was the first and most useful clue how to make sense of the mysterious figure of Jesus. Proverbs 8 presents a personification of divine wisdom. Wisdom is represented as speaking and saying that she was with God from the beginning. At the very beginning of his ways, God set me up. When the heavens were made, I was there. When the hills were formed, when the oceans were filled, I was there. I was with God. Proston Theon, I was with God. Ever delighting to be at play in his presence and so on. At play as a child. Uh -huh. So look. This Old Testament passage would provide a solution for how to make sense of the highly mysterious figure of Jesus, whom the apostles early realized was more than human. How to say he was divine and yet not compromise monotheism, the church had to face that right away. Proverbs 8 gave the clue. He is the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God become flesh. Now then, think about the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God cannot be a creature. Hello, Arius, sorry about this. The wisdom of God cannot be a creature. Do you suppose that God was initially a fool? He wasn't wise until he blundered into making himself some wisdom already. No. God is eternally wise. Any Jew would have said that. And so the wisdom of God is uncreated and eternal. It's prior to creation. And it's this wisdom, pre-existent, thank you very much, high Christology, which has now come in the flesh. You have the same message in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 10. You all know the passage. Who? Though being in the form of God and morphe theou, did not count his equality with God a thing to be held on to, but rather emptied himself and took on morphe dulu, the form of servant, appearing in the likeness of sinful flesh, etc., and undergoing even the death of the cross, wherefore also God hath highly exalted him and given a place, given him a name above every name, that at the name of Christ every knee should bow. You know the passage. All right. Notice the pattern. Pre-existence, descent into the flesh, return to an exalted condition at the resurrection. That's the pattern. It presupposes a pre-existent Christology and... <laughs> 
there's one more thing I have to tell you, and then I promise I'm going to stop. <laughs> In 1 Corinthians 1.24, the Greek all of a sudden gets very strange. Do you know what happens when somebody from the Slavic world, say a Russian, starts to speak English? There has a habit for the direct article to disappear. Because Russian does not have direct article. And so people coming from that linguistic background don't know how to use the thing. So it's a sign that somebody is talking with a Russian accent, with a Russian background, when definite article disappears from speech. <laughs> is exactly what we have in 1 Corinthians 1.24. Christ, wisdom of God and power of God. Not Christ the wisdom of God, nor Christ the power of God. Just wisdom of God, power of God, Christ, that. An Arthurus construction is the fancy word for that. An Arthurus, no articles. This passage that I was just alluding to in Philippians 2, verses 6 to 10, is the same way. There is not an article in there. Um... Oh, I think I can do it by memory. Who, being in form of God, did not think, grasp thing, that to be equal with God, but emptied himself, took on form of servant, and found in likeness of flesh, etc. <laughs> no articles. So what? Reputable form critics have been saying for 40 years that these passages are in fact translation Greek. What Paul is doing there is not using his own words, but pre-established formulas translated from Aramaic. In Aramaic, the definite article is not a separate word. It's a suffix on the end of a noun. It doesn't appear as a separate word. In Hebrew, it's a prefix. Same, same story. And so it has been thought for a long time that the hymn, that the, that the passage, I should say, in Philippians 2, is a pre-Pauline hymn written in Aramaic. Ditto for this passage in Corinthians 1.24. Ditto for the, pa for the famous passage in Romans 1.6. Who was of seed of David according to flesh, but designated son of God in power by resurrection from dead. No articles. It was a formula, a pre-existing Semitic language formula. Goodbye to the gap between alleged Palestinian Christianity and high Christology. Goodbye to it. Time fails me or I would show you the disappearance of the same gaps in these other two areas. I promised I wouldn't say any more, or I would tell you the story of 1 Thessalonians. <laughs> but I promised I wouldn't say any more, and I must keep my word. Thank you very much.